Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from Surprise, Arizona, Everlasting Promises, with Jeff Zarimsky. And we do welcome you to night number two of our Anchors of Truth series, the first and opening series for 2015. Yes. Here from beautiful and warm, praise the oh, Lord, Surprise, wonderful. Arizona. Yeah, we just feel so sorry for the rest of the country uh, tonight because I know back home it was like three degrees today. Yeah, as in one, two, three. Yeah, yeah right. it was very, very chilly. And, and uh, uh, here it was, I think, about 70, 75. I don't know, but it was nice. It was. And uh, we're, we, don't want, we don't want you to feel bad. Don't turn us off. Nothing like that. But uh, <laughs> this is a beautiful place to spend the winter. It is a beautiful place to spend now, the winter. I've been winter. here in the summer, and it's a wonderful place to spend the winter. And... Uh, <laughs> So uh, we uh, have done the 116 to 120 in the summer. Indeed, yes, we have. Yes. But tonight we are in this beautiful church. Pastor Merle is the pastor, and uh, beautiful people in front of us. This is a good-looking congregation. James. It really is, and we've got a good group out here for a Thursday night. Mm -hmm. Fantastic uh, support from this church. This is an amazing church. We want to talk to Pastor Tull a little bit about it. It's only about six years old, the congregation, totally. And uh, they went from zero to this beautiful church in six years. And 160 members, I believe, something like that. This church uh, is a vibrant, growing church. I had the joy of being here for their first Sabbath. And uh, now we're back again. We sort of invited ourselves, but we were... Uh, uh, but Merle said, come on, so, so we did. And we're just so happy to be here with you with, uh, in this beautiful Clearview Seventh-day Adventist Church in Surprise, Arizona. <laughs> you got that right. I got it In right. Surprise, Arizona. Yeah. So we do welcome our, our congregation here in-house and our worldwide congregation to what is the second, we may make this an annual thing, um, Anchors, that uh, focuses on the Jewish work yes, and the unique perspective that our uh, Jewish brethren who have come over to the Adventist church bring. Last night, uh, Dr. Balatnikov mm -hmm. uh, gave us a very powerful message. He's a deep thinker. You know, you've got to kind of get on the same wavelength with he Sasha. He really is. And uh, really challenged our minds. And tonight, we've got another good friend of our ministry, Jeff Zaremski. Yes. And Ralph will, Ringer will introduce him in just a little bit. Again, another deep thinker and a great preacher. Right. And a leader of the congregation there in Florida. He said he's allergic to the cold. So he's yeah. pastoring there in, uh, in Florida. Now, so we, pray the Lord a, we have that. a bonus here tonight for those that are watching live. Because after this first hour, mm -hmm. then we have a second hour, which is going to be a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we invite every single one of you to stay by, and those of you that are home, uh, stay by for that, because they're going to be, we're going to be talking to some very uh, interesting individuals, Sasha uh, Belitnikov and Jeff Zaremsky, and uh, we're going to be also visiting with Ralph Ringer mm -hmm. and talking about the Jewish work and how important it is. Right now, we're going to invite Pastor... Belitnikov to come forward and to have prayer for us mm -hmm. and uh, to lead us in prayer this evening. Um, he uh, is wearing a very quiet shirt, and, uh, <laughs> but we won't have any trouble seeing him. And uh, lead us, would you? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to present your message here from this beautiful church and we ask you to bless everyone who participates bless the speaker bless all of us bless the listeners uh, and the visitors here at the church and our viewers all across the globe so that the holy spirit would touch everyone with the word of truth we pray in the name of jesus amen amen, amen. amen. Well, we've got uh, special music at this time, and Pastor Merle Tull and his wife, Ginger, are a, a real music team, but a real pastoral team. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to invite Ginger to come right now, 
and she's going to be singing for us this time is the name of the song. When Ginger uh, finishes her song, Pastor Ralph Ringer will come to introduce our speaker for this evening, Ginger. to climb There were even times I thought I'd lose my mind But I didn't know that just around the bend stood the greatest hill that life could ever send this time you gave me a mountain, dear Lord, a mountain I'm too weak to climb. And this mountain steep Through the pouring rain the path I cannot see And the falling leaves say winter's soon to be yet in my heart I know your way is best for me and these very trials have brought me to my knees and this time you gave me a mountain Dear Lord, a mountain I'm too weak to climb, and this time This evening, Jeff Zaremski, who leads two of our congregations and is also the director of the uh, Shalom Adventure uh, Outreach Magazine for Jewish People, will be our speaker. Thank you for coming out tonight. I find it better to say that in the beginning because at the end, not everyone is always here. So it's uh, better to start with uh, thanking you for coming now. Uh, what we want to talk about tonight will have to do with our everlasting promises. Uh, we'll be looking at that in relation to dispensational theology, replacement theology, old and new covenant, 
and what still applies today. So all these things will wrap together. Looking at the dispensational theology and replacement theology. I'm not going to talk about all the aspects of it, but in relation to the everlasting promises or the everlasting covenant, the dispensationalists basically teach that the Jewish people were God's covenant people uh, before Christ came, and they continue to be God's covenant people after Christ came. That God gave uh, the Jewish people specific promises and specific commandments, and he's given to the Gentiles other promises, other commandments. Replacement theology basically teaches in relation to uh, the covenants is that the Jewish people were God's covenant people before the cross, before Christ came. But then after Christ came, uh, they were replaced, that's where we get the term replacement theology, replaced with the church. So we're going to uh, look at uh, this a little bit. Let's look at a Bible text out of Romans chapter 11, verse 17. It says, some of the branches were broken off. How many branches? Some of the branches were broken off. Now, replacement theology kind of pictures it as all the branches were broken off, but it doesn't say, it says some. It doesn't say many. It doesn't even say most. It says some of the branches were broken off. Now, what were the, who were those branches? Who are the branches that were broken off? The Jewish, the Jewish people, right. And so then that's the sum of the branches that were broken off. Right? And so then the rest of the branches that weren't broken off, who were they? The Jewish people as well. Right, exactly. So some of the Jewish people were broken off. Other, the other was outside of the sum remained a part of the tree. And then you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them. Who's the you? The Gentiles, that's right. Okay, and they were grafted in among them. Who's the them? The Jews. Right, so the Gentiles are grafted in among the Jews, with the Jews, and became partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Who is the root and the fatness of the olive tree? Jesus, right? God is the root, and Jesus is the root and the offspring of David, right? The root of Jesse comes from the root of Jesse, right? He is the, the root. Uh, he gives a parable, not about an olive tree, but about a vine. He is the vine. You are the branches, right? So he is the source, and, uh, and we are the branches. So in relation to replacement theology, basically they cut down the tree. They have the tree cut down to the root, and then the wild olive branches grafted into it. I wouldn't explain it that way, but basically that's the end result of, of that theology. Uh, dispensational theology uh, it says basically there's two trees. And again, they wouldn't explain it that way, but, but they have basically two different routes of salvation, one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. But we see in the text itself, Romans 11:17, that only some of the Jewish branches were broken off and the Gentile branches were grafted in among them and with them. So we have one tree, one full tree with Jesus as the root uh, and sustaining it all. So Jews and Gentiles together. Clear enough? So both replacement theology and dispensational theology are wrong. They both have their Bible text and, and uh, they both ex ignore the Bible text of the other group. Uh, and so there is a third option and it's again neither one of those dispensational or replacement theology. Even though the majority of Christianity falls into either one of those two camps. But from this text and many others uh, it is blatantly wrong. And many problems with it. Dispensational theology uh, lifts the Jews up on a pedestal. Replacement theology just throws them in the, in the ditch. And, uh, and so neither one of those, as we see, uh, let's look at an example here. Uh, the Israel of God, or the covenant people of God. We have Joshua, Achan, and Rahab. They all lived at the same time. They, their stories, their lives overlap in the city of Jericho. Joshua was the leader of the Israel nation right after Moses. And he, by God's grace, takes us through the Jordan River, brings us up to to Jericho. He is from the tribe of Ephraim and he is faithful to the Lord and the Bible records at the end of the book of Joshua that he did faithful to the Lord all the days of his life and the people were faithful all the days that he reigned and all those that reigned uh, along with him. Achan was of the tribe of Judah. He was part of the Israel nation and part of the Israel army and he was involved in the attack on Jericho. The walls of Jericho come tumbling down 
And God had said before they went into the battle that this is the first city, so it's the tithe, it all belongs to me. Uh, everything is to be sacrificed, um, everything is to be killed, and all the spoils go to, to me. It's the first city. And Eichen didn't believe that, didn't uh, agree with that, and he decides, he sees some nice spoils, some silver, some gold, and some nice clothing, and he takes that and he buries it in his tent, and the, um, God reveals to Joshua and the, and the Israel nation who was stealing and who was causing problems, and it comes out that it turns out that it was um, Achan. And so Achan is cut off and his family are cut off and killed and executed from the nation. Rahab was a um, person who lived in Jericho, a Jerichoite, a, a Canaanitess, a prostitute living in the city of Jericho. She had heard the stories of the parting of the Red Sea that happened 40 years prior. She believed that and she believed and she heard that Israel was coming and, and she believed in the Lord God of Israel and she believed that God was going to work for them and with them and he, she protects two spies that came in and, uh, and they tell her if you put out this red cord out the window when we attack the city we will spare you and your family. And she does, she believes them and she does and she is spared. And there is a Rahab in the genealogies of the Messiah. Whether it's the same Rahab or not, I don't know, but there is a Rahab mentioned there. So which one of these, or which ones of these, either one, are the covenant people of God, the Israel of God? Joshua, from the tribe of Ephraim, faithful commander, is he part of the Israel of God? Amen, okay. How about Achan, from the tribe of Judah, in the army? of the nation of Israel? Is he part of the Israel of God? No, he gets cut off. Right, he gets cut off. How about Rahab? A uh, Canaanite, Jerichoitess, prostitute. Is she a part of the Israel of God? Yeah, she becomes grafted in, becomes part of the nation of Israel. She believes and God accepts her in. Right? And so we have two, Joshua and Rahab, a Jew and a Gentile, is part of the Israel of God, part of the saved that will be in heaven, and Achan, born a Jew, who will be cut off. So we have some, from that example right there, we have some of the branches being broken off. We have a wild olive branch being grafted in among and with the Joshua and the other branches and connecting into the root. Now when did this story take place? Before or after the cross? Before the cross. Way before the cross. Now both dispensational theology and replacement theology teach that the covenant people of God were the Jewish people before the cross. But here we have a clear example that it wasn't a flat across the board that all the Jewish people were the covenant people of God. Achan gets cut off. And Rahab gets grafted in. And we have other stories. Ruth and, and the Gibeonites and the mixed multitude that come out of Egypt. So God's plan has never been the Jewish people there and then someone else later on like the replacement theology would teach or Jewish people then and continuing Jewish people and then some other route for the Gentile people. But God's plan has been and oh, is and always has been for Jews and Gentiles to be grafted in together and among and with into the root of Jesus. Always. From the very beginning. So there's no pedestal, there's no lifting up of one over the other. There's no putting down over one over the other. But all together equal in the sight of God. The invitation has always been equal and open to all people from the very beginning of time. Now there was a, a little bit of a methodology shift a little bit after the time of the cross. Before the cross... God was using Jerusalem and the sanctuary there to draw people to teach him. Like the Queen of Sheba, she comes to Jerusalem, she learns about the sacrifices, she learns about them pointing forward to the Messiah to come, the salvation through the blood. After the cross, the temple is no longer needed, the sacrifices are no longer needed, and so the methodology shifts to where then they're sent out to go and make disciples of all nations. So a little bit of a methodology shift but not a theology shift, nor an ethnic shift. Theology shift like replacement theology would teach, or an ethnic shift 
like replacement theology, which, or dispensation, which teaches the theological shift. And replacement theology, the changing of different laws in different ways. And replacement theology would teach a, an ethnic shift taking place. But it wasn't either of those. Just a little bit of shifting in how to reach the world is all that took place. So let's look at the Old Covenant, New Covenant. Some will phrase that as Old Testament, New Testament. Because the word covenant and testament are interchangeable words. Which I don't think is a good terms. The Old Testament, calling the first part of the Bible Old Testament, and the second part of the Bible New Testament. Because the Old Testament is not the Old Covenant. As we'll see here as we look at some Bible text. And so if we use those terms Old Testament, we are using it to uh, denounce and put away the teachings of the first part of the Bible. Three-fourths of the Bible. And again, replacement theology would use that Old Testament to say, well, the Jews have been done away with. And the dispensational theologists would say, see that the Old Testament is old, it's old covenant, and so the law has been done away. And neither one is right. The Jews haven't been done away with as far as being able to be grafted into God's root, be covenanting with God, and nor has the law been done away with. So when we use those terms, Old Testament, New Testament, we, we actually shoot ourselves in the foot to be able to use the text in three-fourths of the Bible. And, and a good portion of the New Testament are quotes from the first part of the Bible. And so we'd have to really black line those out if those are old and done away with. So let's look at what the Old Covenant and New Covenant is. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 11. He declared to you his covenant. Oh, I'm sorry. You stood, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. You stood at the foot of the mountain. This is Mount Sinai. And the mountain burned with fire, with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. This is before God went up, uh, Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments, God speaking to the people. In verse 13, and he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on the tablets of stone, two tablets of stone. So he declared to you his covenant. Who's the his? Who's his? God. It's God's covenant. That's important right there. His covenant is God's covenant. And what in this verse is God's covenant? He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments there are the covenant, or his covenant. God's covenant that he has given to us is his Ten Commandments that he wrote on stone. It's his gift to us. Now, a, another term for covenant is testament. What would be another term for covenant? What are some terms, some synonymous terms for covenant? What is a covenant? Agreement, right? Promise, right, promise, right. The covenant, accord, that's right. So people covenant together, marriage covenant, making vows to each other, making promises to each other. So the Ten Commandments could be looked at as God's ten promises that he has promised to us. He has promised us, I will meet all your needs according to my riches and glory. You won't have to steal from anyone. You won't covet from anyone else. I will give you contentment. I will give you love in your heart and remove hatred out of your heart so that you won't murder anyone. I promise you. I promise you that I will be able to find you a job so that you'll be able to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I promise you I will give you so much love for your spouse that you will not commit adultery against her. I promise you that I will be such a wonderful God to you that you will not need any other gods other than me. They are God's promises to us. And so it's like a contract. It's like a, it's like a, a, a warranty. And so if it's not working right, you can go to God. You say, God, you promised me that you were going to provide for my needs. You promised me that you were going to find me a job so I can keep the Sabbath. It's your Sabbath and it's your covenant, so you've got to help me. You've got to work for me. You've got to do something here. I am holding you to your covenant. I'm holding you to your promise 
to me. His covenant. His Ten Commandments. Oh, it's a whole lot more beautiful that way. Now the Old Covenant or the New Covenant is actually older than the Old Covenant. As we'll see here in a minute. Because the Ten Commandments, how far back do they go? Back to the Garden of Eden, right? Right, the Sabbath was there in the Garden of Eden, right? Were they allowed to steal in the Garden of Eden? No, that's what they got in trouble for, right? They took something that wasn't theirs, right? And coveting, that, was, that led to the stealing, right? Uh, in a sense, they kind of murdered, right? Eve murdered Adam, given them the fruit, the deadly fruit. Um, they had other gods before them by listening to Satan instead of listening to God. So the Ten Commandments were there from the beginning. And so God's covenant, His covenant, is older from the very beginning. Now in the Exodus version of this, Exodus chapter 19, verse 8, all the people answered together, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So they are, what are they making to God? They are making a promise. All that you say, we will do. So we're making a covenant to God. And, and that's before Moses went up on the mount. So how long did that promise last? <laughs> Not even six weeks, right? After Moses goes up on the mount, he comes back down. And in uh, chapter 24, verse 7, Moses took the book of the covenant. So he went up there. God gave him his covenant. According to the book, Moses brought it down. Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said... All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. So we added to it this time. <laughs> Not only are we going to do it, we will be obedient. We promise you. How long did that last? Not too long at all. Now, did God even ask them to promise him anything? Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. He doesn't say, what's your response? He didn't ask for a response. He didn't ask, will you promise to obey it? He gave them his covenant. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. This is the old covenant. This is the old promises that need to be done away with. These are the faulty promises that are built on shifting sands. Our promises to God are like trying to climb up a rope made out of sand. It just falls apart in our hands. And then in verse 8, same chapter, Exodus 24, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. I was just like that. And amazingly, they came back next week. Huh? Would you, yeah, we just threw some blood. <laughs> took the blood of the goats and the rams and he sprinkled it on the people. And said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you. Who made the covenant? The Lord. He doesn't even mention their promise. He ignores it. He doesn't say this is the blood of the covenant of the promises we made to each other. This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all of these promises. Words. What words? The Ten Commandments. The words of his covenant written in the book, right? Now the book of Hebrews says Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. So there we see covenant and promises are interchangeable words. Better covenant, better promises. Verse 7, Hebrews 8. Verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So he's saying that first covenant had fault with it, right? Did God's Ten Commandments, is there any fault with God's Ten Commandments? No. So it's not God's Ten Commandments that's the faulty one. Is uh, the rest of the Bible, the Old Testament or the first part of the Bible. Is there anything wrong with that? 
No, the Bible says that all Scripture is given for instruction in doctrine and for reproof, written by holy men of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? So it's not the first part of the Bible. It's not the Torah and the writings and the prophets that had fault in them. So that can't be what the Old Covenant is. So what is the Old Covenant? Well, verse 8, finding fault with them. Who's them? The ones who promised, right. That's where the fault is. The fault is in their promise because we don't have the power in ourselves to keep our promises to God. And then Paul quotes, he says in Jeremiah, he quotes from Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It's interesting, he says his new covenant is with who? Israel and Judah. Not like replacement theology says, well, it's the Gentiles. The new covenant is with Israel and with Judah, the Israel of God, which would include Rahab and Ruth and, again, the olive tree all grafted together. Who's making the covenant in the new covenant? I. Who's the I? God. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. He doesn't say, make me another promise. You blew your old covenant promise. You blew your old promise. Make me a new promise. Be more determined this time. Grit your teeth even harder this time. Promise even on a bigger stack of Bibles this time. He doesn't say, behold, we make a new covenant. We wipe that other one out. We're going to redraft it and we'll promise each other all over again. He doesn't say that either. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to wipe this out. I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to make a new promise with new people. He says, I will make a new covenant. God makes the new covenant with us. Just as he did when he spoke his covenant from Mount Sinai. Just as he did when he spoke to Adam and Eve, promising them. God's covenant, God's everlasting covenant that does not fade away. Verse 10, same chapter, Hebrews chapter 8. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Who's doing all the work here? God. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We shall be his people. Why? Because we promise. Because we try real hard? Because we're very determined? Because we're very good? Because God writes his law in our hearts and in our minds. His covenant. Again, that's his covenant. That's his desire from the very beginning. God's work. God does his work in us. And in verse 13, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete and now what is becoming obsolete, growing old, is ready to vanish away. Our old promises, our old trying, our old resolutions should vanish away and become obsolete and stop depending on our own promises and our own self-will and our own determination and our own trying and trust in God. And let God work his work, his covenant in us. Again, the obsolete growing old, that can't be the Ten Commandments, it can't be the Bible, it can't be the first part of the Bible, because those aren't obsolete. And they aren't done away with. And so if you ever hear anyone saying that uh, the first part of the Bible has been done away with, or the law has been done away with, well again, tell me you can't quote then from all these parts, you know, of the Psalms and of Isaiah and these wonderful promises, oh you can't quote those. He said, that's obsolete. That's done away with. That's Old Testament. That's Old Covenant. No, but they haven't grown old, have they? Those promises are good and those texts are just as good today as they were when they were written even thousands of years ago. And then in chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience 
from dead works to serve the living God. When God gave his covenant the first time, he sprinkled the people with the blood of the sacrifices. Now with better promises, God's commitment, God's promises, God's covenant, he now offers blood again. This time, better blood as well. And so certainly the blood part of the covenant is, is also something that has vanished away, right? We don't need to do the sacrifices anymore, do we? Right, no, because he has become the sacrifice. Messiah is the sacrifice, right? And so that part is definitely part of the old covenant aspect. That Now the sacrifices themselves, as far as the shadow goes, the sanctuary itself, as far as the shadow goes, was there fault with that? Was there anything faulty with it? No, it was a perfect shadow. But it wasn't the reality, was it? It pointed forward, it perfectly did its job, it perfectly pointed forward to the Messiah, and the Messiah came just as prophesied. So it fulfilled its purpose, but now that its purpose is done, it's good to read to help us understand the cross even better. But we don't need to sacrifice anymore. So certainly the sacrifices are part of that because we have the blood of Christ that cleanses your conscience from dead works. Who is it that cleanses our conscience from dead works? Christ, His blood. He cleanses us. Not just outwardly, but down into the conscience. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do that, but the blood of Messiah has done that. And when was the sacrifice made? When did Jesus die for us? 2,000 years ago? The Bible says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Right, so as far as God's concerned, again, his everlasting covenant is older. The new covenant is older than the old covenant. It goes back to the very beginning, even before the foundation of the world, as far as God's concerned, his blood was sacrificed. It was a done deal when God made that decision that he was going to 4,000 years later be that sacrifice for the world. So his blood shed forth to cleanse us to remove from us the dead works, the dead promises, the dead attempts. How good are our works? How valuable are our works? All our righteousness is filthy rags. And he cleanses us of our filthy promises, our weak promises. Even our best of promises, how strong can they be? Without Christ we can do Nothing. <laughs> so there's nothing. Nothing. All our promises are nothing. Worthless. Done away with. Obsolete. Throw them away. Trust and hold God to His promises. So let's look at some of these promises. Philippians chapter 1. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Who's doing all the work? He is. He is. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. He starts it and he completes it. He does the justifying and he completes it. He is the completer. Him, not us. You don't trust in him for what he did on the cross and then the rest is up to us. He makes a promise to us. He did something for us and now we got to do our part. There is a part for us to do. Get out of the way. Surrender. Let him work in us. He has begun the work. Let him complete it. Let him do it. Stop trying to get in there. You know our prayers we pray, God help me. Who's the assistant in that prayer? God's the assistant, right? If God's your co-pilot, switch seats, right? Don't ask him to help you. Say, God, I can't do this. I can do nothing. Come inside me. Begin your work and complete your work in me. And do it for me. And do it through me. First, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Who's doing all the work? God. It is God who works in you, both to will and to do. What is to will? To choose. 
You will, you write your will. You choose what you're going to go to, who you, you want this to go to them, and this to go to them, and nothing to go to them, right? You know, you, you make your choices, your will, right? He helps us to choose. We can't even choose on our own. He gives us the power to choose. To both will and to do. He gives us the desire, gives us the power to choose, and then He does it in us and through us. That's His covenant. That's His promise. Not ours. That He will do that through us. His good works. Not our good works. Not our good pleasure. He will do His good pleasure through us. And that will make us the happiest. Not our own filthy pleasures, but His pleasures. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Who's doing all the work? God, Christ. I can do all things because Christ is the one who strengthens me. Again, we can do nothing. Without Him, we can do nothing. But with Him, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah! Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, that's all, again, the second part of the Bible, right? So, well, maybe because the old promises were all done away with, right? And He didn't promise those good promises then. It was only in the second part after the cross He started making great promises. Well, let's look at uh, the book of Exodus chapter 31, 13. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Leviticus 20, verse 8. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Leviticus 21, verse 8. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Leviticus 22, verse 32. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I didn't want to wear glasses, so I printed real large. So maybe you can, this is my notes look like this. Maybe you can help me out here. <clears throat> yeah, help me out here. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Who sanctifies you? The Lord. The Lord sanctifies you. He began the good work. He justified us. And He will complete it. He is the Lord who sanctifies us. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. But it's not our work of a lifetime. It's His work of a lifetime. He continues His work in us. He continues to grow us. He continues to convict us. He continues to show us where we're weak and faulty and continues to perfect us. By His grace, He does the work. In the book of Leviticus, in Exodus, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. God's doing all the work, not us. Leviticus 11.45 um, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 19.2 you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 20, verse 26. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. What's the reason that we are holy? Because of Him. Not because of us. Not because, oh, I've done better this year than last year. And I've tried harder, and I've read more, and I've prayed more. We are holy because He is holy. And then He wants to come and dwell in us and make us holy. Not that it's us who's holy, it's Him that's holy. Him living in us. Because we are again nothing. Without Him we're nothing. But it's Him, all Him. In us and through us and for us. Psalm 119. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Him in the heart. His word in our heart. He is the living word. Him in us. That I might not sin against you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. God wants to put His mind in us. He wants to cleanse our conscience from the dead works through His blood, and He wants to put His mind in us. Now what is the works that it says there for us to do to get His mind? Oh, I went too far there. Where is it there? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, maybe. Yes, okay, let's back up. Sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wants to come in us. That's the hope of glory, Christ in us. Jude 24, to him who is able to keep you from falling. Do you believe that he's able to keep you from falling? Yes. Who is able to keep you from falling? God is able to keep us from falling. 
Him sanctifying us. Him sustaining us. Him keeping us from falling. And present you faultless. Before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. John 1, 2, uh, 1 John 2, verse 1. I write to you so that you sin not. Does John believe that God can give us the power not to sin? Yes, yeah, so he wrote, I, I, I write to you. That was the whole purpose I wrote to you. I write to you so that you sin not. He's able to keep you from falling, present you faultless before his throne of grace. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Amen. It doesn't say, but when you sin, don't worry, you still got an advocate with the Father. It says, I write to you so that you sin not, but if. You sin. We have an advocate with the Father. There is no sacrifice in the sacrificial system, the temple system that God gave. There is no sacrifice for known willful sin. All the sacrifices are for unknown sins that become known to us that we then confess and surrender over to God. He is able to keep us from falling. But if we unknowingly sinned and it becomes revealed to us, we have an advocate with the Father who can cleanse us and forgive us. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What is our job? I am crucified with Christ. So what's our job? To die. That's it. That's our job. Surrender, die, be crucified with Him. And if we're crucified with Him, when was He crucified? From the foundation of the world. Before we were even born. We can accept our death in Him and be dead in Him. Our job is to die. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You see me standing here. But it's not I. It's Christ that liveth in me. And I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Glory to God and only to God. Now to that text in uh, Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. He wants to put his mind in us. Jesus lived a faultless life, was able to kept from sinning. He was tempted in all ways like as we are, but he did not sin. Now, if we have the mind of Christ, does that mean we'll never forget someone's name? Does that mean we'll never uh, get a splinter? See, some people think of this, you know, when, when Jesus sanctifying us and perfecting us and, and, and presenting us blameless and faultless before his throne, they say, oh, you can't make any mistake. That's what I was talking about. I'm talking about not sinning. I mean, Jesus was a carpenter. You think he ever got a splinter? You ever think he cut a board too short? Yeah. He made mistakes. That's not sin. He never chose to rebelliously disobey his father. I mean, he was a baby. Do you think he wet his pants? I mean, do you think he pooped the diaper? I mean, he was, you know, he came in the flesh, right? Those who say he did not come in the flesh are the Antichrist, the Bible says. He came in the flesh, but he did not sin. He did not choose to disobey. He did not rebelliously hold on to sin. And neither do we. By God's grace, we don't have to choose to sin. Sin is knowing to do wrong and doing it. Knowing what's right and not doing it. We don't have to choose to sin. By God's grace, Him sanctifying us, He can give us the power to make the right choice. And then by His grace, to will and to do. Him doing it, not us. Now, we're not going to run around and say, oh, I'm sanctified, I'm, I'm perfect, I'm, I haven't sinned in three weeks, you know. That'll be our first sin, you know. Because <laughs> we won't be looking at ourselves, we'll be looking at Him. Ah, what are we? We are 
Nothing. We are dead. We are crucified with him. So it's not us that's perfect. It's Jesus in us. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This is the new covenant. This is the everlasting covenant. This is the ones that don't go away. These are the powerful promises that we can hold on to. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and preserve you blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is able. Okay, so then what still applies of the Bible? If the Old Testament is not the Old Testament, if it's not the Old Covenant, does it all then still apply? I've got a little formula here that I think could apply to all the law in Judaism. Uh, they determined, Maimonides, that there's 613 laws in the first part of the Bible. So whatever, if there is exactly that or whatever. How, I think this rule can apply to all of them. If the law was given to Adam and Eve before sin entered this world, it is eternal. It's before limited time. Like we're in this age, you know, it's gonna, this age is eventually going to end, right? We're in limited time. Before the garden of Eve, before the sin, they were an endless time, right? They had a weekly cycle, but an endless time. They were supposed to live forever. So it's eternal. If it was given before this limited time, it's eternal. And it's universal. It was given to Adam and Eve, the parents of mankind. So it's universal to all mankind, to all people. The Sabbath, was that there in the Garden of Eden? Yes. yes. So it's eternal and universal. The uh, circumcision, was circumcision there in the Garden of Eden? No, there's no mention of it there. Not until Abraham, 2,000 years later, right? So given to a specific person for a specific time, right? After sin had entered the world. How about sacrificing? Were there sacrifices in the Garden of Eden? No, outside the Garden of Eden, but not in the Garden of Eden, right? Did, um, we already talked about no stealing and all these other things. How about, um, did God say what they could eat and not eat in the Garden of Eden? Yes. Yeah, he said you can't eat from that tree, right? Right? They weren't eating any hippopotamuses or anything, you know, right? He was ruling, and he made some adjustments as we've gone along, but he ruled over what we can eat and not eat. The principles still apply. How about the feast? Did they celebrate a Passover there in the Garden of Eden? No. no. All right, Passover was not until 2,500 years later, right? Those are shadows. Not that there's anything wrong with those things. Right? It's wonderful to look at the shadow to better understand. But, uh, but it's not eternal and universal in that sense like the others. And I think, again, you can apply that to all, and we can know which parts still apply, universal and eternal, and which part we're given for a time, for a limited time, for a specific purpose, as a shadow pointing to Jesus or for some other reason and purpose. So the first part of the Bible is not the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. Again, I think we shoot ourselves, if not in the foot, in the head, by using those terms. But it says those are obsolete, being done away with, faulty, and they're not. It's one Bible. We have one Bible with several sections. The Torah, the writings, the prophets, the Gospels, Acts, the Epistles, Revelation. So we've got sections, but it's one Bible filled with everlasting promises given to us by God that don't change because God doesn't change. Everlasting promises that we can rely on, that we can hold fast to, that we can trust upon and lean upon and trust in Him. So I'd like to appeal to us today to put our trust totally in Him. Not in rebel, uh, New Year's resolutions. Not in our promises. If you've been making promises to God, I'm going to do better this year, God. I'm going to read more of the Bible. I'm going to attend services more regularly. I'm going to get involved in that outreach. God, I promise you, this year I'm going to do better. Stop promising. And ask God, live your life in me. Work in me. And do in me what you would have me to do. And fulfill your purpose in me. Lead me in prayer. Lord, pray through me. Lord, help me to understand your word. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Give me the ability to understand what I read. 
Give me a love for your word so I want to read it, that I desire to read it. That I love your law. That is my desire all day long. Give me that love. Come inside me. Give me your mind. Live your life in me. Write your laws in my mind, in my heart. If you put a CD to a CD player, what's going to come out of the speakers? If it's rap music, what's going to come out of the speakers? Rap music. Right? You put beautiful gospel music in, what's going to come out? Beautiful music, right? Biblical music. Let him, let his mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. Jesus, place your mind in me. If you've been promising to God, I want you to surrender that to him today. If you've believed in dispensational belief or replacement theology belief, you see now that both of those are wrong and you want to surrender that to Jesus. Jesus, I'm sorry for putting Jews on pedestals or putting them in the gutter. Sorry for thinking the first part of the Bible was old and referring to it that way. Jesus, put your words in my mouth. Put your theology in my mind. Speak through me. Live through me. Give me your thoughts, your attitude. And if there's some sin in your life, something you've been struggling with, some habit, some desire, some action, maybe you've been trying to give it up. You've determined to give it up. You strove to give it up, but you haven't given it up. Give up. And let God, let Jesus work in you. Surrender it to him. Confess it to him. And let him remove it out of you. It is his blood that cleanses your conscience from dead works. And let his mind be in you. That will give you the desire for the right. To will and to do of his good pleasure. Let him work in you and through you and for you and empowering you with his everlasting promise and stop living under the old covenant of our own weak promises. If any of those areas apply to you or anything else as we pray together. Our Lord and our God, ruler of the universe, we praise your holy name and thank you for your great promises to us. Live in us, through us. Crucify us. Live your life out of us. and Perfect your will and sustain us and hold us until you're appearing and shine through us to the world for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.